Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the October 6th meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. And we will begin with a roll call. Okay. Commissioner Bertrand? Here. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Montesino? Here. Commissioner Caput? Here. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Yes. Commissioner Friend? Commission Alternate Quinn? Commissioner Koenig? Here. Commissioner McPherson? Commissioner Kristen Brown? Present. Commissioner Alternate Colin Tari Johnson? Present. Commissioner Ari Parker? Here. And Commissioner Rotkin. Are you Commissioner Colin Tari Johnson? Are you here for Commissioner Rotkin? I am. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. You have a quorum. Thank you. I'm uh, sorry. And I also, we're having a little bit of technological challenges. So we are recording the meeting uh, via Zoom, but we're having some challenges with community TV. Okay. Great. Thank you for letting us know. Um, so um, we'll now move on to oral communications. Oral communications is a time for members of the public to address the commission on any item that is not already on the agenda and the commission will listen to all communications, but in compliance with state law, uh, will not take any action on items not on the agenda. Speakers are requested to state their name clearly so it can be accurately recorded in the minutes of the meeting. And I don't see any members of the public present in the chambers for oral communications. Um, are we able to look at participants? Um, and okay, so people can still call in. Well, we're if you can just give me a minute, we're community TV. Right so just a moment. Um, and we will provide three minutes for oral communications today. Uh, we're we're uh, getting that set up right now. Okay. So our first callers are uh, Jean Brocklebank and Michael Lewis, or one of you. Okay. It looks like you're, there you go. All right, you're up. Good morning, you can hear me, I assume? Yes. I, this is Jean Brocklebank. I prepared for two minutes, so um, uh, thank you for the three. I'm here to ask that the Regional Transportation Commission request the city of Santa Cruz to extend the deadline for comments on the draft environmental impact report mm -hmm. for segments eight and nine. First, the reason I want it extended, I ask you to request the city to extend it, is because it was supposed to be 45 days, but anyone looking at a calendar with eyeballs can see that it is only 43 calendar days that we were given um, and really only 42 days since the notice of its availability was not emailed until 4.38 p.m. on Friday. That's the end of day. Oh, I, are my two minutes, are my three, have I spoken for two and a half minutes or was that set for two? You have, uh, Jean, you have a minute and 30 seconds left. Go okay. for it. Uh, second, because the, I began the arduous task of reviewing the 966 page document the weekend after its release and it put in hours already. And I can assure you that the complexity as well as the confusion of the EIR contents screams for an extension of at least 10 days to two weeks for submitting comments. Uh, I've personally requested this, but I was told that the um, shortened uh, period was needed uh, because of funding timing constraints. To this, I reply that the identified significant and unmitigable environmental impacts of clear cutting 421 trees in just this two mile section of the corridor is horrendous enough that expediency for funding is not a reason that the, and not what the California Environmental Quality Act was meant to assure. To top it off, alternatives are manipulated so as to guarantee 
that a proper environmental superior alternative is not included. So I don't know if your commission has the ability to do this or not, but if you do have the ability, I'm asking you this morning to request uh, on behalf of the public an extension to the um, review uh, period for submitting uh, comments. Thank you very much. And Thank Michael um, is now going to speak. I thought you said three minutes, it's set for two. That, that unfortunately the timer we have, um, which we are not able to change is set for two. So we are just providing an additional minute. Um, so I'll, okay. I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, thank you. And now Michael Lewis would like to speak. Okay. We're sharing a computer. Great. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Michael Lewis. Uh, I'd like to extend uh, Jean's comments about um, extending this uh, deadline for public comment to the uh, draft EIR. I realize it's it's not your draft EIR, it's the city of Santa Cruz, but if you we are requesting that you use your influence to ask them to extend this deadline. In addition to the problems with the calendar, uh, that, that is not being 45 days, really even 45 days is not, uh, uh, not sufficient for a thorough analysis and uh, making substantive comments on this very complex and long draft EIR. Uh, for one thing, the language of the alternatives description and analysis are very confusing. That there are two uh, references to the interim trail for two different parts of that. One is an, one is a, an alternative and one is an, a vague uh, phase one of the project. And that's very difficult to, to uh, work our way through and understand. Uh, secondly, there are uh, several sub, um, significant and unmitigatable impacts of this project that need to be uh, researched thoroughly and understood. Uh, and most of the people, most of the public are concerned with their own families and their own work. They don't have a lot of time to put into this. Uh, it took a lot more than 45 days for professionals working full time to, re to produce this document. And the public uh, doesn't have the uh, depth of knowledge and the time in order to do that. Uh, finally, the uh, cumulative impact section of this document is extremely long and confusing. There are many, many projects listed in there that have nothing at all to do or any relationship to the rail trail, and they tend to obscure the language in the cumulative impact analysis that relates directly to the other parts of the rail trail that would affect this project. So we're asking you please to uh, use your influence on the city of Santa Cruz to extend the deadline for comments for this to at least 60 days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Um, so I'll just make a quick comment here. It, because this is not an item on our agenda today, we um, are not able as a commission to take action. Um, but as your city of Santa Cruz representative to the RTC, um, I will follow up with our public work staff and, and uh, get in touch with you to try to learn a little bit more about the timelines. Um, okay, thank you very much. Our next caller is Brett Garrett. Good morning. I am Brett Garrett, proposing a new transportation solution for the rail corridor and beyond. Um, and I appreciate Yesenia sharing my slides. Um, I call it the Rail Corridor Automated Transit, or RailCat for short. This system will provide quiet, efficient transportation using the existing space, taking full advantage of the rail corridor without derailing the possibility of freight operations. This concept is based on small vehicles that actually exist. A company called Glideways is testing them nearby in Contra Costa County, and they hope to build a system in San Jose. So why not here in Santa Cruz? Um, next slide, please. I mentioned Glideways specifically because its vehicles are extremely narrow, allowing true bi-directional traffic, including stops, to fit within the existing rail corridor footprint. That is one lane in each direction and a third lane for letting passengers on and off. Just to be clear, the railroad tracks would remain in place, available for freight trains to run during the system off hours. The infrastructure could be pavement with railroad tracks, just like Chestnut Street in Santa, uh, Santa Cruz. The rail cat system can provide 24 hour service, except when freight trains need to operate. 
Um, next slide, please. This is an animation showing how the system can operate in harmony with the existing rail trail. The Railcat vehicles don't need to stop except when picking up or dropping off passengers. You could show up anytime, day or night, and ride nonstop all the way from Santa Cruz to Watsonville. It's designed to create an easy, stress-free commute, even if you have a bicycle or a wheelchair. It is also designed to minimize the impact on cars and trucks on the street. My expectation is that Railcat and trail users would have the right of way, but Railcat is to be managed as a system with um, tiny vehicles clustered together in groups to ensure plenty of opportunities for road users to safely cross the railroad tracks. Um, I don't know why the animation stopped. It, it should keep going. <laughs> but there's one on the website, railcat.org, that, that keeps going. Um, conventional rail has some serious limitations, and Railcat solves these problems. The Santa Cruz County rail proposals that I've seen call for just one or two trains per hour, which simply isn't frequent enough to convince people to give up their private automobiles. Railcat would provide on-demand, bi-directional service any time of day or night, eliminating any worries about the seven o'clock train, trying to, trying to get there on time for the seven o'clock train. Furthermore, the conventional trail can only have, the conventional train could only have a very limited number of stops because when you add more train stops, it's a compromise making it take longer for the train to reach the destination. But when you add Railcat stops, you just make the system more convenient and more useful. Railcat can be extended to conserve, um, to serve Cabrillo College and our existing transit stations, and even UCSC. All it would take is a five-foot lane, similar to a bike lane. So please take a look at the website, railcat.org, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Our next uh, caller is Brian Trail Now. Oh, wait, sorry. I think everything's moved around a little bit. I think Michael Saint, you're up next. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Michael Saint with CFST. Uh, I'd like to take you on a trip to the future. It is now New Year's Day 2050. The goals set by the 2015 Paris Accords on Climate Change have been achieved. After 200 years of living with environmental impacts of the Industrial Revolution, the trend to global warming has stabilized. Global level of atmospheric CO2 is now 460 parts per million. It is 67% higher than the pre-industrial level at which agriculture and early civilizations of humankind were able to develop and flourish. If we only achieve the Paris Accords climate change goals of zero emissions and we continue our present day activities of business as usual, and make transportation policy that increases greenhouse gas emissions instead of reducing it, we will leave our children and their children a planet with the following issues. The great coral reefs will be gone. We will have oceans devoid of once vast fish populations. Most old growth forests and rain forests, forests will disappear. Sea level rise of approximately two feet. The Arctic ice pack gone. Humans will have taken over nearly all the land needed for a diverse ecosystems. Will our children survive this scenario? Uh, they might, uh, they might not, we just do not know. The path we have chosen in this scenario is a risky one from which there may be no turning back. Do not take your RTC decisions lightly when you vote on transportation projects. Don't just vote a certain way because you're afraid to be chastised by your peers or vote so your peers will vote with you on your project interests next time. Being pragmatic has its place, but when it comes to preventing a climate catastrophe as described above, your projects that are put forth and your votes must be environmentally focused and climate driven. We have no time left for business as usual. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Our next caller is Barry Scott. Welcome. Thank you, uh, commissioners. This is Barry Scott in Aptos, and uh, thank you for the three minutes. Um, I want to talk to I, I want to talk about the uh, FEIR for segments eight and nine. I am so happy 
and and but not surprised to find that the ultimate trail was found to be the environmentally superior project in 13 out of 14 categories, including trees. The proposed project is shown to require the removal of 381 trees, while 404 trees are removed under the optional first phrase, the phase, the alternate, alternative one and alternative two. Uh, the only project would be the no build that would that would have a, a lower impact on trees removed, but 13 out of 14. So I hope that we can move forward with the, the rail trail as it's always intended to have been uh, with the tracks in place. I'm also delighted to see in the uh, consent agenda repairs moving forward for the Pajaro uh, River uh, Bridge, rail bridge. Thank you for taking care of that. And also an item on erosion control. Um, uh, presumably for the Manresa La Selva area, so badly needed. You know, we we own a rail line, a piece of infrastructure. The repairs are are critical to ever doing anything with it. You know, whether even uh, to, if we're studying rail transit, we have to. The first thing to do is to take care of the bridges uh, and the rail line, and do that that uh, preventative maintenance. And so I look forward to hearing and reading about more projects to at least maintain the current state, but really it needs to be improved to, to an operational condition. And as promised, I think uh, all along and, and with the contractual agreements to bring the entire line up to working condition for minimal freight so that we can eventually use it for, for public transit. Um, along that same vein, my final comment, um, on Monday's Bicycle Advisory Committee, which I wasn't able to attend, but I was able to review the agenda, there is a proposal for Measure D uh, reduction from the uh, rail infrastructure preservation efforts, $2.5 million that, meant that, that is under consideration, reduce programming for bridge inspections, remove programming for pre-construction of rehabilitation of rail bridges, reduced program for future phases of repairs, uh, including drainage culvert replacement and, and slope stabilization. Moving these funds from the, the already minimal 8% of Measure D is dangerous, and I hope you'll consider uh, finding other ways to do this, including pulling funds from the 17% that's for the trail to uh, improve the corridor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. See, it looks like we have one more caller on the line. Uh, Brian from Trail Now, you are up. Hi, everybody. Um, good to see you, Brian here. Hey, I wanted to inform you all, if you don't know, the Amtrak train down in Southern California has been shut down because of um, uh, coastal erosion. And essentially, the problem is, is the train is vibrating the earth there and they can't sustain it. And that's why actually in Southern California, Amtrak and uh, um, Del Mar down there has allocated $300 million for planning to relocate Amtrak tracks that are on the coastal bluff. And if we're seeing, what we're seeing is um, with the Coastal Commission, they're not allowing, because of the sea level rising requirements, they're not allowing for infrastructure investments. So for us as a community to believe that we're going to have a train, 60 trains a day, any type of expensive rail system running along that coastal bluff is not realistic. And the issue really comes down to is we're losing out today on using that valuable corridor for active transportation. And it's very disappointing that it's been a decade and it's gonna be decades more before we get to actually use that corridor. And it's, it's, it's not good for our community to not follow the legality of where the state is heading. The state is not gonna allow us to get funds. They're not gonna allow us to build a, an expensive train. So, Mr. Peoples, you're, we're seeing, you're, we are proposing to do demonstration trails. Um, we're working with uh, Supervisor Koenig on it. Um, we are hopeful that we'll be able to do two of them, uh, one in Aptos 
Um, we're using the corridor today as a demonstration trail. Um, we'll use private funds as well as the harbor. Um, and so we're hopeful that we can demonstrate the value of using that corridor today for active transportation. So thank you for your time. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we start following realistic plans and we're here ready to invest in opening that corridor. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. It looks like we do not have any other hands up for oral communications. So we will now move on to our regular agenda. And um, let's see, do we have any con uh, additions or deletions? Uh, no that? additions to a, a, or deletions, Madam Chair, but we do have a handout for item 23, which was posted to our website. Thank you. Okay, we will now consider the consent agenda. This is items four through 18 on today's agenda. All items appearing on the consent agenda are considered to be um, minor uh, and will be acted upon in one motion if no member of the RTC or the public wishes an item to be removed. Uh, and members of the commission may raise questions, seek clarification or add directions to consent agenda items without removing the item. Uh, as long as no other commissioner objects to the change. So I will um, call, ask the commissioners if you have items you'd like to pull or ask questions or comment on. Thank you, Chair. Uh, no items I'd like to pull. I just had a question on item nine, which is the repairs to Manresa. Um, so if I understand correctly, this is just temporary repair measures. I think it mentioned, you know, some tarps and, and tie downs. Um, and uh, this is, so this is less, permanent than the original repairs we'd contemplated. Uh, I'm just curious if there's any update on where we stand uh, in discussions with the Coastal Commission around more permanent repairs to this site. So you are correct, um, Commissioner Koenig. Uh, these repairs are fairly minor in nature. They're more immediate um, um, protection measures for the existing slope and a clogged culvert, which had flooded the tracks and uh, contributed to the erosion on the bluffs. Uh, we continue to work with the Coastal Commission to come up with a more long-term plan. Uh, we have been having continuous meetings with them um, and expect to have more information in the following months. Okay, thank you. You know, can I follow up? So we, sure. we would, we hope to get something back from the Coastal Commission, an indication of their viewpoints on this in a couple months, do you think? Um. I think it's probably going to take longer than that. Um, the commission wants to see an alternatives analysis. Um, they're also very interested in um, our plans to move forward with passenger rail and trail at that location. Um, so they want um, quite a bit more information on what the long-term plans would be for the, the coastal bluffs. Um, I do expect that to take more than a couple months. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments from members of the commission? Uh, okay, are there any members of the public who would like to pull an item on our consent agenda? Or commissioners on the line? I don't see any hands up. I move the consent agenda. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda and we'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Bertrand. Agreed. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Montesino. Yes. Commissioner Caput. Aye. Commission Aye. Alternate Schifrin. Aye. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner McPherson. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Aye. Commissioner Parker. Yes. And Commission Alternate Kalantari Johnson. Aye. That passes unanimously. All right. We will now move on to our regular agenda, and I'll ask members of the commission if you have any oral reports you'd like to share. Okay, I do not see any hands up. So we will move right along to the director's report, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Preston, Director Preston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the state's legislative two-year session ended on August 31st. 
And the governor has been spending the last month signing and vetoing bills, many of which could impact local transportation projects and programs. Item number seven on today's consent agenda provides a summary of some of the legislation that RTC staff has been following. A major theme of the legislation enacted is associated with aggressive climate measures to transition away from oil, deliver clean, reliable, and affordable energy, create um, prosperous communities, and protect Californias from extreme effects of climate change. The Commission's commitment to sustainable transportation solutions continues to be aligned with the administration's priorities uh, set forth in this last session and expected to continue over the next two years. Our program of projects are therefore well positioned to seek, seek state funding in the coming months and years ahead. One piece of legislation that affects all bodies subject to the Brown Act is AB 2449. AB 2449 will go into effect in January 2023 and will expire in January 2026. Because AB 361 continues to be in effect until January 2024, RTC Commission meetings can continue in virtual or hybrid fashion, as we are doing here today, as long as the RTC continues to make the required AB 361 findings, as we just did as part of item 12 on today's consent calendar. Therefore, AB 2449 is not anticipated to have any impacts to RTC meetings until 2024, unless the declared state of emergency is ended. If come 2024 and AB 2449 is the only new Brown Act legislation, be advised that although it does loosen some Brown Act's physical attendance provisions, it comes with restrictions. A majority of the board members must be physically present and remote participation is only allowed under two specific circumstances, just cause and emergency circumstances. These circumstances are narrowly defined. The legislation imposes teleconferencing requirements and has strict limits on how frequently a board member can claim just cause or emergency circumstances, such that most members will need to be present at virtual, virtually every meeting or participate remotely from a physical location open to the public. So it looks like we'll have a little more than a year of the status quo. I will keep the commission posted throughout 2023 on any other legislation which modifies physical attendance at meetings so you can plan accordingly. Um, I have an update on upcoming RTC work this fall. Um, staff will be very busy throughout the fall starting the two planning grants to prepare a climate resiliency plan and an equity plan, while we also consider opportunities for the next round of Caltrans planning grants and the current round of Senate Bill 1 grant opportunities. Staff will also be seeking committee input for Measure D five-year plan amendments for all regional programs with staff recommendations expected at our November meeting. So next month's meeting will be a little bit heavier than this month's. Commission input on item 23 on today's agenda and committee input at October committee meetings will be valuable as well as information obtained from yesterday's interviews to procure a consultant for our rail and trail project will also, will also help guide staff's recommendations. Assuming negotiations go well, we expect to also have a recommendation in November for a consultant firm to lead the concept report preliminary engineering and environmental work to prepare an EIR for electrical passenger rail and trail project. We are timing this round of Measure D five-year plan updates with our fall budget amendment, which is also scheduled for next month's meeting. Staff is also overseeing work associated with the city's effort to construct segment seven, phase two of the rail trail, start construction on Highway 1 from Soquel Drive to 41st Avenue, bid the Highway 1 project from Bay Porter to State Park. Um, we will also be managing the two rail line preservation contracts on the Santa Cruz branch rail line that you just voted on on con the consent calendar, as well as ongoing planning and project deliver act activities such as the uh, EIRs for the trail projects. Finally, I wanted to inform the commission that the RTC turned 50 years old this year. We are planning an open house celebration, likely at RTC's new office sometime this November. This will be an informal opportunity to meet with staff and commissioners 
discuss accomplishments and goals of the agency moving forward. Staff will have more information on the event as we further develop details. Fellow commissioners, that concludes my director's report and I hand it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Preston. Are there any questions for the director? Okay, I will uh, take it out to the public for comments. I see one hand and I'll call on Mark Masidi Miller. Welcome. Welcome, thank you, Chair. I, uh, I missed the opportunity to comment on uh, the consent agenda, so I'll just make this brief. Um, my name is Mark Masidi Miller with the Santa Cruz County Friends of the Rail and Trail. Regarding your item eight, the Pajaro River Rail Bridge Rehabilitation, the Friends of the Rail and Trail want you to know we fully support the expenditure of Measure D 2016 funds as the local match for this $285,000 project. The Friends were stunned by the enormous change from the original bid of $1,709,470 to the current cost of only $285,000. This change represents a savings of over $1.4 million on a $1.7 million project, or if expressed as a percentage, this change represents an 83% reduction in cost. The Friends understand this incredible cost savings was achieved by working closely with and taking full advantage of the many decades of practical experience local rail operators, Roaring Camp, offered on this project. The Friends want to encourage the RTC to continue collaborating with Roaring Camp. <clears throat> the next, <clears throat> excuse me. The next project upon which the RTC should collaborate with Roaring Camp is the rehabilitation of the Capitola trestle. If memory serves me correctly, RTC staff estimated the rehabilitation of the Capitola Threshold at something like $20 million. Imagine achieving a similar 83% reduction in the cost of restoring the Capitola Threshold to a serviceable condition. If one does the math, the cost of repairing the Capitola Threshold could be reduced to $3.4 million, a very reasonable cost that is well within Measure D 2016 funds allocated to the rail line maintenance. It seems the most prudent way forward when it comes to rail line maintenance and repair efforts is to take full advantage of Roaring Camp's practical experience. The Friends of the Rail and Trail trust the RTC will do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masidi Miller, um, for your uh, oral communication. I um, let's see. No other questions. I don't see questions from the commission. So I think uh, seeing no other hands up, we will now move on to the Caltrans report. Item 21. Good morning, chair and members of the board. Uh, Brandy Ryder here, office chief for Caltrans District 5, and I'll be providing the Caltrans District Director's report today. Uh, the first thing I wanted to announce is that tonight Caltrans in partnership with the city of Watsonville and the RTC will be hosting a virtual community meeting from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. The link for this meeting can be found on the Caltrans District 5 Twitter and Insta pages and the Watsonville Insta page. There are six projects under development in Watsonville over the next 10 years. This meeting will focus specifically on a capital maintenance improvement project that has complete streets elements that would make improvements in Watsonville's downtown core. These improvements are in alignment with the downtown specific plan, and some of the improvements under consideration include a class four protected bike lane from Green Valley Road to Freedom Boulevard along SR 152, a road diet from Freedom Boulevard to Beach Street, and bulb outs to provide improved access for pedestrians. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to provide information on the projects that are anticipated, the timelines, and to gather input from the public. We invite you to participate in this meeting. I believe we've also had RTC staff as well as city staff send out announcements with details on how to access the workshop. If you need more information, we'd be happy to provide it. Uh, secondly, we have an update on our Caltrans Sustainable Transportation Planning Grant Program. Uh, yesterday, the draft application guidelines were released for comment and will be out for a 30-day public comment period as early as this month with more details on the program coming uh, in future weeks. There are three specific categories. 
Uh, the first category is the Sustainable Communities Grant category, which will have $29.5 million available statewide. Uh, the Strategic Partnership Planning Program, which will have $4.5 million statewide, and a new program that was established with SB 198, which is Climate Change Adaptation Planning Program, and that will have 50 million. The call for applications is expected this December with a due date of applications anticipated in the winter of 2023. Grant workshops will be hosted by uh, District 5 Caltrans and we will be um, providing support during the application period. The award announcement for the grant program is expected in spring 2023. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out. We've been working with your RTC staff and they're well aware of the program. Uh, we are willing though to uh, work with local jurisdictions that have questions about the program, feel free to reach out. And then our final, uh, my final announcement for today is to use caution with traveling on the state highway system and entering Caltrans work zones. Uh, unfortunately, uh, about a month ago, we had a staff person who is a maintenance worker out in the field that was hit by a vehicle that came, entered into a work zone. And as we enter into the fall season with shorter days, less daylight and changes in weather, we're trying to promote the safety of the traveling public and our highway workers is on the forefront of our minds. In California, we've seen a 30% increase of fatalities over the last year on the state highway system and have been observing more incidences within the work zone. We thank everyone for doing their part in avoiding distracted driving. And if safe to do so, please move over a lane or slow down when passing vehicles with flashing amber lights. With that, this concludes my report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I see. I'm going to, uh, uh, Commissioner Hernandez, I saw your hand go up first, so I'm going to, I'll, I'll call on you with questions and then uh, uh, shoot it over to Commissioner McPherson. Go for it. I did, yes, could, could I get um, the webinar information emailed to me uh, to the, you know, same same email as the RTC gets, I get my emails to the RTC, the Hernandez District one, and also the, uh, if I can get, just shoot that same email and give me all the District 5 updates from Caltrans as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Rick Pearson. Thank you, Madam Chair. On uh, item number 19 on the project update, the uh, wildlife undercrossing on Highway 17, I see that the uh, construction timeline is 2023-24 with the favorable construction weather, uh, not so much water favorable but uh, is that going to be moved up or what's the timeline for completion of that at this point it's uh, item number 19 no you might not have it i don't know if you if there's any change in timeline from 23 24. Yeah, I'm not sure. Let me follow up on that. I don't believe that there's been a change in the timeline. Um, you know, obviously, weather can have a change, but uh, let me follow up on that. And that's for the wildlife crossing project on Highway 17 specifically. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. Are there any members of the public who have a comment or questions? I do not see any hands up. I'll give it a moment. I see a hand up. Um, okay, so I'll call now. Call on Michael Saint. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown. Yeah, just caught that one comment. I wanted to uh, respond that uh, um, Caltrans representative mentioned something about a thirty percent increase in. Was it traffic fatalities or traffic issues and also work zone incidents have also increased? Um, I hope everybody heard that because uh, basically, how do we resolve that issue? I mean, as we continue to widen highways and uh, focus on cars, this is going to be a continuing issue. And I hope you all take heed in that and try to take our funding, and may I suggest we increase and redirect funding from the automobile to mass transit. And I think that type of report will be something in the past. Just a comment, and uh, I hope you've listened to it and um, 
vote more for mass transit, not improving cars and helping them get around. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so as the chair, I, I will say, um, since a member of the public brought it up and I made a big note here about that, um, thank you for uh, your report, uh, Ms. Ryder, and, and the, the figure of the increased, um, I believe it's collisions uh, in, in work zones was uh, striking. So I think it is worth us all reflecting upon that and thinking about ways to, um, you know, continue to um, build policy and, and infrastructure um, program that uh, address the challenges of, uh, of cars on ever wider um, highways. So, um, and, and roads as well. So um, we are uh, certainly, um, aware of it and you know I think our community has and agencies have been working on uh, a lot of um, kind of st strategies around this around vision zero and um, uh, etc and I, I just want to highlight it and remind us all to um, take note um, okay I think that's all on item 21 Caltrans report and I'm going to now move us on to item 22 uh, this is the Central Coast Zero Emission Vehicle Strategy Update, and I want to welcome Amanda Marino, Maya Kulkarni uh, from Santa Barbara County uh, Association of Governments, and Jim Dankowicz and Mike Gusen. I'm not, uh, if you're all here, I see you. I see some of you on my screen. <laughs> Hopefully you're all here um, uh, to give us an update. Uh, and so Jim and Mike from, from DKS, take it away. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, good morning. My name is Amanda Marino, and I'm a transportation planner uh, for the RTC. And the Central Coast Metropolitan Planning Agencies are developing a Central Coast Zero Emission Vehicle Strategy to identify electric vehicle charging infrastructure needs in Central Coast counties, including Santa Cruz, Monterey, San uh, Benito, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura. So this is funded by through a Caltrans uh, Transportation Planning Grant. And this effort is led by the Santa Barbara County Association of Governments um, in partnership with San Luis Obispo Council of Governments and the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments. So staff recommends that the Regional Transportation Commission receive a presentation from SBCAG staff and DKS Associates Consulting Firm and provide input on the Central Coast Zero Emission Vehicle Strategy. So Mike um, from DKS Associates, uh, you may go ahead when you're ready and I think we have a presentation um, that we sent to um, Yesenia to put up whenever she's ready, or I can also share my screen. Amanda, you can go ahead and uh, share your screen and then you can manage the presentation if you have okay. it. Up. Okay, just a second. Good morning. Um, while she loads the presentation, I just want to um, you know, introduce myself. I'm Mike Houston with DKS Associates. I'm the project manager on this project, helping to identify future charging opportunities uh, within the Central Coast. Uh, this is a very exciting project, and we are probably, I don't know, halfway through the project or so uh, in, the, in the analysis, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, obviously, there's huge concern in this community about the environment, and so the purpose of this plan largely is to decarbonize transportation by uh, finding zero emission vehicle strategies and also um, siting. So why don't we go to the next slide? Okay, so um, this is the agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about sort of who uh, and why and how it's being funded what we're trying to achieve, and then um, how we're going to implement this. So let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, starting with who is involved. Uh, as, as was mentioned, uh, SBCAG is leading the effort with SLOCOG and AMBAG. Um, we're also in, you know, it's very comprehensive. It's a, it's a true regional plan for, for six counties. So we're in also including Ventura County. Transportation Agency for Monterey, Santa Cruz County, and of course, San Benito Council of Governments. On the consultant side, uh, DKS is leading the project effort with support on the transit side from Stantec, from Frontier Energy with regard to um, 
fuel cells and Mariposa for public involvement. Next slide. So this has been funded with a generous grant from Caltrans uh, for the majority of the funding. Uh, there's also local match contributions from the leading agencies that I mentioned earlier. Um, and, uh, you, you know, this is part of, you know, you're fortunate in California. I'm, I'm based here in Seattle, Washington, where we don't have this kind of grant support. So you're very fortunate to have these kinds of opportunities. Next slide. So why are we doing this? Well, there are six main objectives to this project. The first is to access, assess, excuse me, the existing zero emission vehicle infrastructure with a focus on the unincorporated rural areas between the cities that experience significant interregional travel. So the presumption that I believe led uh, Caltrans to fund this project was that there's already a lot of effort in the incorporated areas within the study area to identify opportunities for zero emission vehicle charging and fueling, but not so much in the spaces between the incorporated areas. And it, as I'll show you in a, in a few slides, um, that's definitely the case in terms of the actual infrastructure that's on the ground. So again, focus is on rural areas and on interregional travel. Um, we also want to identify what the key challenges are. Where are the gaps? What are the barriers to interregional travel for motorists? You've probably, many of you, I, I assume, drive electric vehicles. You suffer from range anxiety. There's not enough chargers. How can we address that? Uh, and this is not just true for motors, but it's also true for regional transit, which rely on that same charging infrastructure as well as freight or goods movement. The third objective is to identify where the equity issues currently exist um, for charging. So charging is not right now, all the chargers that have been deployed or most of the chargers are there uh, thanks to um, the private sector. And those are done for business reasons, not necessarily to address social equity. <clears throat> the fourth, Objective is to ensure that the improvements in infrastructure um, are equitable and accessible to all users, especially for the underserved populations. <clears throat> and then to recommend that these improvements and related investments, policies and implementation strategies uh, to promote zero emission vehicle infrastructure adoption. And last but not least, to better position these agencies for state and now federal funding for electromobility infrastructure. And between the time the project began and now, uh, significant amounts of funding have become available, and I'll talk about that in a second. Next slide. So these, um, um, one, of the, one of the things that has happened since is the National uh, Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, which was adopted by the federal government, which has a total of about seven and a half billion dollars in funding for electric vehicle charging infrastructure. And that's going to be allocated uh, through the state, through both state allocations and competitive grants. And so that's something that happened again since the project was scoped. So a big focus of this is to position these counties for projects that could be funded through this very large program. It's the largest funding program that that we've seen yet and a great opportunity. Uh, also SB1 grant application opportunities uh, through, the, through Caltrans. Next slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about the public outreach process. This is a very, again, it's a large geographic region. It's very diverse. And so we've uh, been having a public outreach process which I'll talk about in the next couple of slides. So who are the key stakeholders? Well, again, a lot of different interests that go into zero emission vehicle planning. The first of all is agencies such as yourselves, school districts, uh, the public transit agencies that are dependent upon charging infrastructure, then the utilities who are gonna be providing the electrical power to, to um, power these chargers, uh, and then the users of chargers such as um, a goods movement, regional freight uh, providers, um, marine ports and so forth, uh, and then, of course, residents. Most charging, you, as you're probably aware, occurs at home, um, but not everyone has access to home charging. So how do we serve the needs of those that do not have at-home charging? Major employers. Workplace charging is probably the number two form of charging, so making sure that major employers are involved. And, of course, the charging infrastructure industry. So that's primarily the charging networks like EVgo, Tesla, Electrify America, ChargePoint, and others. So those are the key stakeholders, and we, we've been doing stakeholder outreach, and I'll talk about that in a few slides as well. Next slide. So what have we been asking these stakeholders? Well, there's a number of different questions because we want to get input from those in the community who know this information. So specifically, what infrastructure investments are being planned? So we've done a survey of different agencies of you know, what's been done. Again, the, the focus primarily has been within the incorporated areas, and our focus is on the 
areas outside those, but it's important to have that information for context. What are the incentives that are needed uh, to help bring this forward and to reduce the disincentives? Uh, other than funding support, what else can be done? And then last, um, any advice regarding more um, electric vehicle travel that can reduce barriers to electrification of transportation. Next slide. So we have a project website and the, the URL for this website is in the staff report. So take a look at that. I encourage you to go on to this site and uh, explore it. I think it's very useful. It contains a lot of information. This is essentially the contents of that website, but we have a lot of information. We have an FAQ to kind of bring everybody up to speed on uh, transportation electrification. There's a survey to get input. Uh, there's a, a schedule of the project itself, um, and then as we develop deliverables, such as the existing conditions report, we post those to make them accessible to everyone. Uh, there's also an interactive mapping tool, which has its own URL, and the URL for that is also in the staff report. And what this does is allows, and I'll show you some slides of this, uh, allows access to um, the information ge geographically. So if a stakeholder or a member of the public wants to make a recommendations for charger by charger type, they can do so on an interactive map. Then we take that information and incorporate that into our recommendations once we vet them through a process. Also meeting materials and then upcoming events are posted on the website as well. Next slide. So I mentioned the social pinpoint and this is a screen capture of what it looks like. It's basically a large interactive map of the entire study area. And then uh, it shows the existing chargers that are there today based on data that we've already provided. Uh, and then um, anyone who goes on there, including yourselves, can post comments and recommendations. Um, and so this is a very useful way to get a true interaction. And we've, we're, we're doing this um, on a number of other projects throughout the state of California as well. And we find it's a very effective way to, especially in a time of, of uh, increased dependence on the internet, uh, to get true interactive information. Next slide. So where are we in the project? Next slide. So we are focusing right now on the um, actually doing the recommendations. But so far, what we've done is developed the web page, which I've talked about. So I'm not going to repeat that. Um, we've been having ongoing meetings with the advisory committee, which rep is re includes represent uh, representatives from all the different agencies and the stakeholders. Uh, we had a interactive stakeholder workshop. And um, we've also uh, completed the uh, draft existing condition support, which we're waiting for feedback from um, uh, the client, SBCAG. And you'll find that um, that, that report is also on, on the web page. And I'm going to show a couple of slides from that to kind of give you a high level overview of what we found so far. Um, and then, of course, we've completed the draft regional transit assessment, which we're about to post. We just have to finalize that and get it, that up on the website as well. Next slide. So the existing condition support really focuses on kind of the key corridors, which are um, primarily either al designated alternative fuel um, alternative fuel vehicle corridors, and those are um, that's a program from the Federal Highway Administration, which basically is setting up specific corridors for electric vehicle charging as well as other alternative fuels. And um, those there's been six rounds of designation, and we've identified all um, all of the ones that have been designated to date. As part of our project, we may be identifying additional alternative fuel corridors, which will then be eligible for future funding under NEVI and similar programs. Uh, we've also looked at travel patterns. What are the regional travel patterns that help give guidance as to where EV charging infrastructure and uh, hydrogen fueling infrastructure needs to be located? We have inventoried the different chargers by type using alternative fuel corridor data as well as a focus, again, on the study area, which is really outside of the urban areas. Let's go to the next slide, and I'll, I'll show you what this actually looks like. So this is some um, draft data on a uh, very high-level summary of all the different chargers throughout the area. This actually, I believe, is, is er an, an early round of data. We've since updated this. The correct data is on the existing conditions report, and it's broken down many different ways to make it as useful as possible. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So this is sort of one a summary table. Next slide. And um, uh, so what, what our focus really on, and again, since the project began, NEVI came out and NEVI has, uh, which is the National uh, Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, really is prioritizing key corridors for chargers. So what the United States is trying to do is develop an, an entire nationwide network 
of EV charging infrastructure. So these chargers need to be every 50 miles, and there needs to be at least four high power DC fast chargers, meaning 150 kilowatts or higher. Most DC fast chargers that are out there today are about 50 kilowatts. So this is three times faster than existing chargers or many existing chargers. So what it'll do is it'll allow an EV driver to uh, obtain a full or at least an 80% state of charge in, in about a half an hour from an empty or from a 20% uh, battery. So that means that it, it essentially is trying to replicate uh, current fueling that we use with gasoline. A little it takes a little bit more time, but basically it allows people to make long distance trips by electric vehicle. So to do that, they need to be close to the freeway, typically within a mile of a freeway interchange. And these chargers need to be up 97% uh, of the time, which is much higher rate of uptime than current chargers are today. So this is really bringing the United States into the 21st century. So we can catch up to perhaps Europe, maybe even China, with regard to transportation electrification. Again, the focus of this program and this project is on publicly available chargers, not focusing so much on workplace residential, but really on, on chargers that are available to the general public and to the other types of users. Next slide. So this is a map from the existing condition support showing, showing the existing conditions. The green, the green dots on the map show level two chargers. Level two chargers are typically, um, you know, for public, in the public chargers, that is, are for opportunity charging. So again, you're going to spend anywhere from an hour to four hours charging your vehicle. So um, these are for relatively long dwell times that make a lot of sense for, you know, places where people are going to spend more time. But for interregional travel, really the focus is on DC fast chargers. And we've identified two different types of DC fast chargers those that are available to all vehicles, as well as just the Tesla superchargers. Now, Tesla uh, builds chargers strictly for Teslas, although now there's an adapter so that other vehicles will be able to use them. But really, Tesla's built its own charging network. Since Tesla got ahead of the other charging networks, there's a lot more of them in most geographies than other types of chargers. So for the purpose of this report, we've identified them separately. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So this shows the study area. So again, the focus is on unincorporated areas. The, the incorporated areas are shown in yellow, but the unincorporated areas within a, a mile buffer of freeway interchanges are illustrated in blue. So these blue locations are the focus of our current efforts to identify future charging sites. And you'll, I'm gonna go through several different counties just to show you the example. Again, if you'd like to uh, explore this in more detail, please go to the website and you can download a copy of the existing conditions report where all of these maps were pulled from. Next slide. So this is uh, Monterey County, as you can see for the, and this is true of all of these, all of these geographies, um, most chargers are located in urban areas. That's because that's where folks are located, that's where services are. Uh, and we wanna make sure that the unincorporated areas also get addressed because um, we wanna make sure that range anxiety doesn't prevent people from uh, adopting electric vehicles, especially in a large geography such as the Central Coast. Next slide. And again, this is showing um, in the area of Monterey County, uh, the key corridors where those buffers are located. And, and the focus again is on al designated alternative fuel corridors. Uh, most of these counties don't have that many major corridors, and so those are the ones that we're focusing on. Next slide. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little about where we're going from here. Next slide. So um, we have um, our, well, currently are developing our um, evaluation of opportunities, that is focusing on where to site future charging infrastructure. And this is where you as stakeholders of this project can contribute. Uh, social pinpoint is the way to do that. So go on, take a look at uh, where your, your um, other members of the community have identified charging locations and make similar recommendations or uh, comment on other recommendations. It's very much of an interactive tool. Uh, we're looking at different service ranges by different vehicle types. Again, we're not just looking at light duty vehicles, but also medium, heavy duty and regional transit. Uh, we wanna make sure there's sufficient redundancy in coverage so that there's not no long queues um, as have, recur have occurred in recent history at Tesla stations in the area. Uh, and we wanna make sure that we're looking at the appropriate uh, considerations such as um, the dwell times of drivers, such as amenities near those charging locations. We're also holding focus groups for the different key stakeholders and public workshops. And then um, by the end of the year or early next year, we plan to draft the uh, final, uh, the draft and final um, uh, Central Coast uh, Zero Emission Vehicle Plan. And that will also be posted on the website. 
Next slide. So that's it for where we're at today. Hopefully this answered some of your questions, um, but probably generated others. And if you do have questions, I'm happy to stay and answer them. Great, thank you so much for the presentation. Really interesting. Uh, I'll turn to commissioners now on questions and comments. Okay, uh, Commissioner McPherson, we'll start with you. Yeah, thank uh, thank you for that report. And uh, I'm pleased to see that uh, the stakeholder, one of the stakeholders is the Central Coast Community Energy. Um, the one concern I have with implementation, and I understand that we're, this is all not gonna be done overnight, but is there, are you gonna measure the stress on the, the grid, the electrical grid in the process? Like 10% of uh, Californians have um, electric vehicles and if they have 20% or so forth, uh, because we saw, you know, in that last uh, heat wave that we had, people stay home, don't charge your cars, et cetera. Is, is there gonna be an element of the measurement of what we have to do to improve the grid or so people can live life as usual as they're charging their cars, so to speak? Um, I just am curious to see if that's going to be an element of the study. Uh, that is an excellent question and a very appropriate one. Um, the answer is it's not technically part of the scope of work. The reason for that is, and, and you know, obviously um, we can't charge vehicles without appropriate amount of electrical capacity, not just at the grid level, but at the individual charging site. Um, that really is up to... Um, uh, PG&E and to Central Coast uh, uh, Community Energy and uh, any of the electrical distribution networks that are providing that. This is information, the grid information is something that utilities can't share, uh, both for, for two reasons. One is for security reasons, um, and the other is because there's so much volatility in electrical demand. So really that's up to them to forecast their loads and determine um, how that's going to work. What we can identify is where the charging locations are going to be and what the peak loads are at those sites. So this will serve as an input to, to the utilities planning process for load forecasting. So that's something that they are going to have to develop. Obviously, we're going to consider um, their input and they are, as you identified, they are key stakeholders in this process. And independently, uh, we are working for them as consultants directly as well on, on other projects. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Usen, for the presentation. It's uh, ex exciting that we have this opportunity, and I'm glad to see uh, how much work you've already done. Um, you know, we have, of course, a infrastructure for fueling cars today with all our gas stations. And I'm wondering how much private gas stations, um, you know, with some combination of carrots and sticks, uh, could be encouraged to put in more EV chargers and, um, you know, how how you see that fitting into the future equation. I mean, it's those are policies that we could implement at the local level, uh, county by county, and it would be helpful to have some sort of um, uniform set of recommendations from your working group on how to approach that. Um, first of all, thank you for this, the recommendation. That's not just a question, that's a recommendation. And I think we should incorporate that in, into our plan. I think we already are. Um, yes, um, you know, we are not going to transition from um, uh, gasoline and diesel overnight to electric. It's going to take time. And so the first of all, the petroleum industries, uh, petroleum industry is, is very much aware of this transition. They recognize that this is both a threat and an opportunity. And so what you're seeing, what we're seeing in the industry is many of the petroleum companies are buying EV charging networks. For, for example, um, uh, uh, can't think of the name of the former company now, I think. Uh, but anyway, Shell, Shell purchased, um, oh, Green Lots. Green Lots was a major network uh, that provided a lot of the chargers in the study area, in fact. Uh, that's recently been acquired uh, last six months by uh, Shell Oil, and now it's called Shell Recharge Solutions. And so they are basically looking at their existing assets as opportunities to dispense electricity uh, for electric vehicles, not just uh, petroleum products for um, ice-powered vehicles. Um, but um, I, I think we're going to start to see more of that. They recognize that their industry is in transition. So um, but I think your question and suggestion is what can we do in addition to provide further incentives and potentially regulations? So I think those are great input that we will address in the plan. Thank you. Hey, I'll take it out to commissioners who are on the line. I see uh, Randy Johnson. Commissioner Johnson, you're up. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
So my question is, as we transition to the EV world, uh, um, are the needs of highways still gonna be there? Are we gonna still, still need roads? Because if you listen to prior speakers in 50 years, unless we change things, unless we stop widening highways or whatever, um, it's essentially gonna be doomsday. But from what I understand with respect to EV and what the mandates by the state as we move more towards electrical vehicles, we still are going to need roads. Is that a fair statement or am I wrong? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. So um, one of the transitions that my company and many others like it are focusing on right now <laughs> is the transition overall to shared, autonomous, connected, and electric vehicles. Um, and vehicles themselves are changing. We're starting to see um, er, um, um, electric uh, aircraft as well, electric vessels. So one of the things we're seeing overall is transition to electric transportation period. Uh, and, and electric, by the way, includes fuel cells. So uh, the focus of, of this project is largely looking at electric vehicle charging infrastructure, but we're, we're really seeing all types of transportation electrify with both batteries as well as fuel cells. Um, I believe personally that surface transportation is, is here to stay. That means we are going to need roads, um, but we're gonna see more diversification. We are gonna see uh, aerial transportation in addition um, that will also require charging infrastructure. This project is only focused on surface transportation. Uh, perhaps five years from now, we'll be working on one that's focusing on airborne transportation because that is reality. We are seeing, uh, I, I'm here, as I mentioned in Seattle last week, we had a, a, a test flight of a commercial electric um, um, airliner, basically. So we're starting to see that. Uh, we're also seeing more autonomous transportation coming into play. Those autonomous vehicles will be electrically powered and they will operate on roads. Um, so hopefully the service transportation will decarbonize, but I don't see any um, alternative that will replace road transportation. It's going to augment road transportation with other modes, uh, rail as well. Uh, hopefully all of it will be zero carbon. Uh, Chair, may I ask just one follow-up question? Sure. Um, so in one of our shopping centers in Scotts Valley, there I think there are 15 or 20 charging stations, which, uh, and it's my understanding, I don't have an electric vehicle. Um, are those paid? And in the future, will people in your vision have to pay for the charging that they do on their vehicles or will some of it be free? So um, chargers don't pay for themselves in general. And one of the challenges that we are addressing is that reality. Um, right now, most charging, you know, for example, the biggest charging networks in the country are Electrify America and Tesla. Uh, Electrify America is funded uh, by Volkswagen through the Dieselgate settlement. Um, and so it's essentially a subsidized system. Utilities are subsidizing charging. Um, um, Tesla is subsidizing its uh, infrastructure to basically serve as an amenity for Tesla buyers. Um, supermarkets, many of them have installed, and other retailers have installed chargers because it, you know, it draws customers. Um, but uh, and the cost of electricity is relatively small. Level two chargers are are not particularly expensive, so there's a real incentive. Uh, in California, uh, uniquely. Many chargers are still free, which frankly, as a Washingtonian surprised me because here you don't see a lot of free chargers. I believe in the future, as more and more vehicles become electrified, the economics will change and we'll see more charging for charging. Um, but I do suspect that retailers who are very competitive and now also have to compete against online retail will continue to provide amenities, including things like charging and, and various other um, incentives. Well, thank you for being so well informed. Appreciate it. Well, it's it's my best guess. <laughs> okay, our next up is uh, Commissioner Hernandez. Yeah, I was. Uh, my question is: uh, Is equity considerations going to be part of, of the uh, formula for site selection for dev charging in this project? Um, I, I'm sorry, did you ask if the, uh, what this equity, equity issues, yeah, if equity oh. issues are going to be part of the consideration, uh, for the formula for site selection of, of Zev chargers, 
EV chargers. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. And, and if you look at the existing condition support, there's a whole section on that. So one of the, and, and that's actually, um, it was it was part of our scope going into the project. And then, as I mentioned, Nevi came along during the, the development of the existing condition support. Um, and so we are using uh, Federal Justice 40, um, as well as Cal Screen as part of our selection criteria. So we want to make sure, again, a key goal of the project is to address the needs of economically and socially disadvantaged populations who have so far really been left out of the transportation electrification revolution. Uh, most of us think of EVs as, as luxury vehicles that are very expensive, and they are. Uh, but going forward, um, as they become more common and more electric vehicles enter the used vehicle market, the price is expected to drop. And I'm guessing within the next five years, we're going to see price parity between electric vehicles and um, ICE vehicles. In fact, we already have seen that with the Ford F-150 pickup truck, and at least until Ford raised its prices. Um, so you can, you, a year ago, you could buy, you could order an F-150 electric for the same price as the gas equivalent. Then, then suddenly demand spiked and Ford said, you know, we can make a little bit more on this. So they raised the prices. But uh, it's, it's only a matter of time before these become very much normal. We need to make sure that everybody has access to charging, regardless of economic opportunity. Thank you. And, um, you know, so, so it's basically looking at census tracts and certain, certain census tracts is that. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure how the data is aggregated. You know, we're using uh, both the state and the federal data sources, and I'm not personally involved with doing the GIS analysis. I do believe it's at the census tract, um, but it might be at the TAZ. I, I'm not exactly sure how the data is aggregated. Well, as lucky customers that got that Ford, if that Ford uh, Lightning because they sold for forty six, and people are reselling them for one hundred twenty thousand uh, on yeah on auction sites. See, if I was so well informed, I would have bought one and done that. But I'm I'm still riding a bicycle. Demonstrating demand, yes. Um, okay, any other questions from commissioners? All right, I do have a question I wanted to ask, and I'll say uh, I've I've looked at the tool. I've been on the social pinpoint site, and it's it's fascinating. It's really interesting to go in there, and you know, I started, I went down the rabbit hole, and I was in Santa Barbara County and some other counties as well. But um, and it's it's really worth checking out, and um, it it, it in, inspires to uh, make suggestions the way it's set up. So I thank you for uh, your report, and I really appreciate this. Uh, I do have a question related to how the information from this uh, interactive tool is going to be used. As you said, the uh, your project is is really focused on how to get uh, EV charging infrastructure uh, into uh, rural and and underserved areas. But the the interactive map itself allows you to drop a pin kind of anywhere in the in the mapped area on the co central coast. So um, I'm just wondering uh, where that how that information will be utilized, um, you know, because I'm I'm tempted to go in and drop and I see that others have right <laughs> for places where they would like to see infrastructure, um, which is not within the um, kind of formulaic uh, uh, formulaic uh, pattern there of one mile from the highway corridor. So just wondering how that's uh, how that's going to be used uh, to to facilitate planning. Oh, great question. So, um, you know, planning EV charging infrastructure is as much art as it is science. And we, we do use as sophisticated tools as we have. We have um, uh, we have we're, we're using big data, but we're also using crowdsourcing and we're trying to balance the two. We're looking at this from a 30,000 feet. Uh, level, uh, it's a very large geography. We don't have the uh, the local knowledge. And so we, uh, you know, I should say that the planners on the team, a lot of them are from the area and, and know the area. Um, we have, um, you know, a lot of local knowledge from on the team, but not to the same extent that the community does. And so what we do is we want to make sure that input from citizens and uh, residents and um, employees who, who live, work, and commute in this area 
can really uh, weigh in on this. If someone from the area knows of a particular site that might be appropriate for a particular reason, uh, we want to have that input. And so we found this to be a very effective tool on projects that we've done. We're working for, a, for Madera County, working for San Joaquin County. We're, we're wrapping up a project in the city of Encinitas. Um, and so local knowledge is really useful to us. Um, and so that's, that's how we use that information. So what we want to do is then, if we're kind of comparing different areas and trying to select a site, the first place we're going to look is Social Pinpoint to see if anybody from the community has made a suggestion that we can then apply in our recommendations. Thank you. Okay, I will now check and see if there are any members of the public who would like to uh, comment. Actually, I see um, Director Preston, you have your hand up. I wanted to. Yeah, I just wanted to expand a little bit on the question that you answered. Um, it's really important to do these planning grants. Um, there's been a lot of investment in um, infrastructure funding for electric vehicles. Um, um, it was mentioned in our consultant's report that um, there's this program called NEVI or the National um, Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Structure, um, Act and um, Caltrans just submitted a plan on that. And when we do these planning grants, we meet a lot of the requirements that this, the federal government is gonna be looking for. Um, the funding is gonna be cycled through the state. And um, having this information already completed will make sure that the central region will be eligible for funding and that a lot of these locations will be looked at. And a lot of the themes that were brought forward by, um, by our consultant, you know, such as equity um, and outreach, they want to see that we did that. Um, they don't want to see that it's just blindly being uh, implemented. So it's a very important step in making sure that the uh, central region is not left out of the electric uh, infrastructure funding that is gonna be made available. Um, it is being led more by um, our MPOs. So that's why AMBAG contributed funding, whereas RTC did not. But we are participating because we have more local knowledge and we have the opportunity to get the word out and make sure that there's participation, participation by the Santa Cruz community. Thank you. All right, uh, we will now take it out to the public. Our first caller is Michael Saint. Welcome back. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown. Mike, just an excellent uh, presentation. I really appreciate all the, uh, the knowledge that you're giving us today. Um, I've been working, this is my seventh year starting with Ecology Action as an EV ambassador, and it's a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And EV infrastructure has always been an issue as long and as well as range anxiety. But uh, try to please remember that all of you, 90% of the charging that people do with electric vehicles is done at home. Uh, we have our own fueling station. Uh, it can either be setting on the roof as solar or that you're using the uh, incoming electricity from PG&E and 3C Energy. Uh, after that, of course, you have public charging long distance. Um, the range of these cars are getting better. Uh, I have a Tesla Model 3. My wife and I just took a trip of 3,400 miles with our Tesla, and we had no issues with charging. We had a weak spot up at um, Glacier National Park where the nearest supercharger was 140 miles away. But we called ahead of time and reserved a level two charger for a five year hour period. And that gave us enough electricity to explore the park. Um, so for me, I have no range anxiety and I'm working on about uh, a car that has 300 miles range, but I only use about 220 to 230 of it most of the time. And that's where these cars are nowadays. So a lot of that's being resolved, but we do need better infrastructure. Um, two of the areas I would really suggest on focusing, multi-unit dwellings. That is the question I get all the time at my EV events. I live in an apartment, I live in a condo. How do I charge my car? So that needs serious consideration. Uh, also, which is very important is charging at work. And that will help with the grid issue. 
if you put solar in or some type of renewable energy, you can be using the excess solar energy during the day and not even get it on the grid. You'd be charging your cars at work. Uh, those are my two suggestions. I will go through that uh, link and uh, pinpoint some spots, but um, I would really suggest you follow the Tesla Super Network where they've gone and what they've done. I mean, you can drive across the United States, Canada, and never have any anxiety about it. So um, trying to do something separate from what Elon's trying to do, maybe just reinventing the wheel. I mean, I know he's a little odd, but I think he's done a great job and we wouldn't be where we are right now if he hadn't started this sustainable transportation. Uh, so good luck and I'm totally supportive of what you're doing. It was a great presentation uh, and I'm going to leave the meeting now. I got some other things to do, but I'm wishing everybody a very pleasant uh, Columbus Day weekend. And thanks for all your work. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Uh, do we have other members? Uh, yes, we thank you. Um, I see on my screen here, we have another hand raised and that uh, would be Jacob Waisaki. You're up. Welcome. Uh, am I coming through? Yes. Okay. Hi, uh, this is Jacob Wysocki. And uh, so my background is in electronics engineering and I did study physics to do that. Um, I, have a, I have a doctorate. Um, and one of the most important lessons I learned is <clears throat> no free lunch. I learned this very early on. Um, Commissioner McPherson asked about uh, life as usual. Um, and how we can make a transition. Um, obviously, we need to get away from uh, gas-powered vehicles because of the climate. Um, and he brought up infrastructure. Um, Michael Saint brought up inf infrastructure and the infrastructure requirements are substantial. Um, there's another concern. Um, so I, I read a paper uh, prepared last year uh, from the Geological Survey of Finland by Simon Michaud. And he, was, he did an estimate, this is sort of back of the envelope, of the amount of materials, raw materials, nickel, uh, copper, um, lithium, that are required to do a transition to 100% renewable. Um, and he came to the unfortunate conclusion that there are not enough materials in the world to do a transition to um, everybody using electric vehicles at the same rate that we're using cars uh, today. Um, and then this, this, is, this is the issue. Um, so, you know, we, we have the question of equity. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Maybe we'll have some amazing breakthroughs. Um, but what it looks like the future is going to be is that the fabulously wealthy will have access to cars um, and not everybody else will. And I think the bottom line is, uh, while electric vehicles are great, um, we, we have to have mass transit as, as the key focus. Um, and that, that will be what ultimately gets us away from traffic is that people just won't be able to afford cars anymore. Um, so life as usual uh, is not gonna be sustainable. Um, I wish it were otherwise, um, but anyway, so thank you, uh, Mr. Usman for your, for your work and uh, please do your best. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I believe that concludes our public comment. Bring it back to the commission uh, for any additional comments. And do we need to take action? I believe we're Don't just agree. accepting the, Sorry. yeah. Yeah, I think we're just accepting. So any additional comments? All right. Um, once again, I would encourage. I want to thank um, Amanda Marino, our uh, RTC transportation planner, uh, and Mike for your presentation. And look forward to hearing more. Um, our next item, our next and final uh, item, is an update on coastal rail trail maintenance and trail funding. And we have with us Grace Blakesley, senior transportation planner, uh, with uh, Guy Preston standing by. 
Good morning, Commissioners Grace Blakesley of your staff. It's really nice to be here with you this morning. It's my first in-person meeting back, so it's nice to see you in person. Um, today, I'm going to be providing you with some information about maintenance of the Coastal Rail Trail. Um, I'll start by reviewing the status of the various segments. Um, segment 5, which extends from Davenport to Wilder Ranch, is approaching 100% design. Uh, phase 1 of the project is fully funded, and we expect that Phase 2 will be fully funded through a Federal Lands Access Program grant but we are awaiting the grant award announcement, which is expected in November. Um, as you know, segment seven, phase one is complete. It was completed in 2020 and segment seven, phase two is under construction. And this will complete the trail between Natural Bridges Drive and Beach Street near the wharf. Sangoons eight and nine are under development and extend from Beach Street to 17th Avenue in the County of Santa Cruz. Uh, as mentioned earlier by a member of the public, the draft environmental impact report for these segments is out and public comments are due on November 4th. A public meeting will be held on October 19th at 5 p.m. to receive comments on the draft environmental impact report. And the city is seeking state active transportation program funding uh, for construction. We anticipate that the California Transportation Commission recommendations for grant awards will be released sometime this month. Segments 10 and 11 are also under development and extend from 17th Avenue to State Park Drive in the County of Santa Cruz. Uh, these segments are also in preliminary design and environmental phase, and we anticipate that the draft environmental impact report for these segments will be released sometime next year. Segment 12 from State Park Drive to Rio Del Mar is also under development, and the draft environmental impact report is scheduled to be released sometime this winter. Uh, segment 12 is seeking construction funding from the SB1 Congested Corridors Grant Program, and the RTC's application for grant funding will be submitted this December. Segments 13 through 20, except for segment 18, uh, phase one, have not advanced past the planning stage. However, RTC recently released a request for proposals for electric rail transit and coastal rail trail development, which would advance these segments. Can you advance it? I don't know. We tested it earlier, but. Thank you. Um, so trail maintenance is needed to preserve the trail and to provide for a positive trail user experience. At the May 2022 RTC meeting, the RTC requested additional information about trail maintenance and funding. Uh, currently, RTC has two signed maintenance agreements with local jurisdictions for segments eight, 7 and 18. Uh, these segments are the ones that are completed or under construction. Uh, to help op offset the trail maintenance costs for these segments, RTC started programming Measure D Active Transportation Program funds for trail maintenance as part of the Measure D five-year program updates and agreed to split the cost of maintenance with cities 50-50 up to the programmed amount. Uh, staff endeavors to have these maintenance agreements in place prior to construction, and RTC has currently programmed over $1 million for trail maintenance in the current Measure D five-year plan, which includes maintenance for segments 7, 18, as well as segment 5. Next slide, please. Um, so to facilitate the discussion about trail maintenance spending, um, your staff coordinated with local jurisdictions to identify maintenance needs and costs. The maintenance costs include things such as sweeping, debris removal, vegetation management, fencing repairs, litter and graffiti removal, encampment cleanup, um, inspection and clearing of drainage structures, as well as other structural inspections. Um, maintenance costs are estimated for different periods after the trail is operational, the first five years, five to 10 years after the trail is open, and then 11 years um, after the trail is um, open. This is done because some aspects of the trail don't require maintenance in the first five years of operations. For example, pavement repairs and trail amenities are not anticipated. Um, repairs to, excuse me, repairs to the pavement and, and trail amenities are not anticipated in the first five years of operation, but would be expected um, in subsequent years. 
Although complete pavement rehabilitation efforts may be needed after the trail is operational sometime between the 20, 10 and 20 or more years, the cost for trail pavement rehab is not included in this maintenance cost estimates because the need for significant rehab will likely not incur, occur until after the expiration of Measure D um, for most of the segments. Also, exact, exact trail maintenance costs per mile are going to vary by segment. Um, for example, segment five, Wilder Ranch to Davenport, um, will expect it to require more trail sweeping at farm crossings that are not, um, are, that don't occur in the other segments. And then other segments have more structures um, than others, and those will require additional maintenance as well. Next slide. Okay. Um, so trail maintenance, the focus of today's discussion, is an eligible expense of Measure D active transportation funds. Um, of course, trail development and construction is also an eligible expense for Measure D, and RTC has begun developing 17 miles of the trails. Uh, quarter maintenance is also another eligible expense for Measure D active transportation funds, and this provides funding for drainage and vegetation control maintenance and management of the rail right of way. This is work that extends beyond the trail footprint and is expected to continue even after the trail is constructed. Trail oversight and management also is an eligible expense of Measure D and includes coordination and planning for the coastal rail trail. The Measure D active transportation category is projected to generate $194 million over the 30-year life of the program. Uh, 56 million have been programmed in the first 10 years to trail development, construction, corridor, and trail maintenance and oversight. This, the program funding does not fully fund the segments that are under development, and RTCs and local jurisdictions are working to leverage grant funds to construct these segments. Construction is dependent on um, the award of these grant funds. Even though, even with grant awards, Measure D Active Transportation Program to date still exceeds revenue projections for the 10 year period and will require debt financing to maintain current project schedules. And this was discussed by your board in May 2022. In addition, trail maintenance funding beyond fiscal year 27 still needs to be identified for completed trail segments and for future trail segments. Assuming a 56 million of the Measure D Active Transportation Program funds are for corridor maintenance over the life of Measure D, and RTC maintains their current commitment to trail development, approximately 81 million will remain for trail maintenance and oversight development of additional segments going forward. The cost of trail maintenance through 2029, when trail segments under development are operational, is anticipated to be about $2 million, and then $1 million annually every year after that. Next slide, please. To not oversubscribe Measure D active transportation funds over the life of Measure D, RTC and local jurisdictions will need to be successful in leveraging the state and federal funding for trail development they will also need to strategically use Measure D funds to advance projects simultaneously. For example, we are doing that with the Highway 1 and Segment 12 project, as well as coordinating the development of electric passenger rail with the remaining coastal rail trail segments. We also need to seek cost sharing agreements with local jurisdictions for trail maintenance to preserve funding for trail development, as well as consider new funding sources for trail maintenance in the long term. Next slide, please. So RTC and local jurisdictions, we discussed options for funding trail maintenance. Uh, we looked at funding 100% of the trail maintenance costs with Measure D active transportation funds. We looked at splitting trail maintenance costs 50-50 between Measure D and local jurisdictions. We looked at splitting trail maintenance costs approximately 80-20% Measure D and local jurisdictions by assigning trash receptacle clearing to local jurisdictions, which makes up about 20% of the maintenance cost, or funding 100% of trail maintenance with local jurisdictions fund. All jurisdictions, local jurisdiction staff express concern in fully funding maintenance with its current resources available for maintaining its various facilities. Nonetheless, the cities of Santa Cruz and Watsonville expressed willingness to meet prior agreements, which specifies that they are responsible for maintenance of the trail, and RTC shall pay 50% of the cost of maintenance up to the Measure D programmed amount. 
County staff expressed willingness to perform maintenance activities, but they indicated they do not have funding available to pay for all or half of the cost of trail maintenance. They did indicate a willingness to fund the cost of trash receptacle clearing services, which is approximately 7,000 of the 32,000 per mile per year. If Measure D active transportation funds are programmed to fully fund trail maintenance over the life of Measure D, less funding would be available for leveraging construction grants. In the event of a funding shortfall, the commission could consider programming discretionary funding, surface transportation block group program, transportation development act or STIP funding, or local jurisdictions could consider programming Measure D neighborhood category funding. The local jurisdictions and RTC could also commit to seeking a new funding source to complete trail construction or specifically for trail maintenance. Next slide. So when programming measure the active transportation funds, RTC staff suggests that the RTC consider that yes, trail maintenance is an eligible expense under the measure the active transportation program, that there's limited local jurisdictional funding for trail maintenance that funding for coastal rail trail development and construction is still needed. And utilizing Measure D active transportation for trail maintenance will decrease the amount available for trail development. And then finally, that trail maintenance needs will extend beyond the Measure D sunset year, 847. Next slide. Today, um, staff recommends that when programming future Measure D active transportation funds, and as part of future Measure D five-year plan updates, that the commission continue to advance coastal rail trail projects by strategically investing funds to complete pre-construction activities and to continue to strategically program funds in a way that leverages state and federal grant opportunities. Staff also recommends that RTC direct staff to negotiate maintenance agreements with local jurisdictions and joint responsibilities for seeking funding to require that trail maintenance agreements be in place prior to construction and to annually program funding for trail maintenance as part of Measure D updates. That concludes my report. Thank you so much. That was that was great. Um, anybody on the, uh, the commission here in the chambers have questions for Ms. Blakesley? Anyone in... Um, uh, Yes. Okay. Com uh, Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, uh, I don't. Maybe you. this uh, wouldn't be a good question until the full trail is uh, is really completed. But is there any way that uh, again to get to this uh, word measurement about once the trail is built and then to start from the first year, and then then if how much increase there is in usage of the trail? I mean, uh, we want to lure people into using it as much as possible. Is there? Are we going to have any kind of a measurement of that type to know? How many people are, I don't think we're going to have cameras at every mile, but uh, there's something like that. Do we have any kind of a way we can see how many people are using it in comparison year after year? Yes, um, we would. And that's actually a requirement of the active transportation program um, at the state level to provide um, counts. Um, we would expect to do something that's similar to uh, Arana Gulch, and they do have cameras that count um, users annually. And we've used that information in the past to make projections about trail use. Commissioner Randy Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I notice in both your um, meetings with the RTC meetings with um, Watsonville, Santa Cruz, the County of Santa Cruz, um, kind of going over the plans, what the trail means, uh, the future, white uh, highways and so forth. Um, and I just want to mention, you know, you, you stated that you felt that, you know, we could consider new funding sources and so forth uh, in respect to uh, kind of meeting the uh, fiscal challenges. Um, but Scott Valley is kind of isolated over here. And, and to some degree, so is the, all of District 5, including San Lorenzo Valley. So the benefits of trails and even highways and so forth, uh, we don't quite feel uh, all the benefits so much because we're over here and all the work's been done over there. Yeah, we do pay our half cent sales tax. And I've mentioned before, you know, cities like Scotts Valley that have low property tax, uh, we kind of try and watch our dollars carefully 
Uh, we are committed to pay a 30 year half cent sales tax for the receivable for 30 years, I guess starting in 2016. But when you start talking about more money going into these projects, you have to understand that if we had a dedicated half cent sales tax that for just Scotts Valley, over 30 years, it would be like 45 or $50 million. Whereas, you know, each year we get a couple hundred, I think we're getting a couple hundred thousand dollars this year uh, for uh, one of our overpasses. So um, is, is staff aware, is the RTC aware of uh, what concerns might be in the fifth district, uh, including San Lorenzo Valley, that all this money and all this activity is going along that corridor but we're kind of isolated over here. And yet I keep hearing, hearing talking, talk about, um, you know, new funding sources and new, new uh, maybe even taxes. So it makes me a little nervous, that's all. So I just kind of wanted to bring that to your attention. Hey, thank you. Looks like we uh, do have members of the public who'd like to comment. And so I'll take it out first to Mark Masidi Miller. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown. Uh, my name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm with the Friends of the Rail and Trail. And the Friends of the Rail and Trail are fully supportive of the RTC's uh, recommendations. We are particularly happy that the RTC will continue to require maintenance agreements be in place prior to advertising for construction bids. Maintenance of this uh, trail will be critically important to people continuing to enjoy it you know, over the years to come. So thank you. And uh, please know we're 100% supportive of finishing the trail as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Our next caller is uh, Jean or R. Uh, Jean Brocklebank and Michael Lewis. This is Jean Brocklebank. I continue to be dismayed by the piecemeal fashion, the piecemeal way of doing business in studying and slowing, uh, but surely recognizing the enormous environmental impacts of developing this 32 mile corridor. Add to that the piecemeal fashion of procuring and keeping funding mechanisms for maintenance in perpetuity. Our county keeps building infrastructure with, in quotes, free money without a budget for maintenance once the free stuff is done. As an example, maintenance responsibility was given to the County Department of Parks of the one and a half block section of the redeveloped pedestrian walkway at the harbor portion of Twin Lakes Beach. That maintenance has gone lacking, apparently because Parks does not have the budget to do it justice. Native plantings in the landscaped area have disappeared, now one third of their original volume. Weeds pro proliferate. The garbage container areas are frequently overflowing. The lids on the bins left open, inviting birds and rats to get at the contents. In short, maintenance matters. Our eyes tell us something is amiss with maintenance all over Santa Cruz County. How can the RTC guarantee ongoing maintenance of the entire corridor of 32 miles when the county cannot maintain its roadway landscaped area, which lose trees every year, trees that are never replaced due to lack of maintenance funding. As you heard today, the RTC will have to find funding after Measure D ends in 23 years. Um, so I, this is just not the way somebody would run their household <laughs> or a business. And it, it does bother me. It bothers especially the physically conservative portion of my environmental soul. And thank you so much for considering my comments. Thank you, Ms. Brocklebank. I will now call on Jeff Gaffney, our County Parks Director is on the line. Welcome, Mr. Gaffney. Thank you so much. And uh, I wanted to thank Chair Brown and the fellow commissioners. And also uh, just uh, to clarify, yeah, I'm Jeff Gaffney and I'm Director for the County Parks Department. And I also wanted to thank uh, Grace Blakesley and, and Guy Preston for all their hard work with this and all the RTC staff. I feel like um, we've worked really hard together to try to come to some mutually agreeable solutions. Um, and we're very supportive 
Uh, we've been working also with the community uh, department of, of community development and infrastructure. And uh, I feel like we're all coming to a place where we are really feeling the future is going to happen and that this trail construction is exciting and uh, going to be a benefit to our entire community. And we also want to be prepared for that future. So in saying that, I think that, um, you know, Ms. Blakesley hit on some of the points that we were concerned about. And uh, some of those things are the cost of maintaining this. I think that's been highlighted already. And so I'll just share that um, I think we can find some um, middle ground here. We've come to some agreement internally here, both with CDI and parks that we can probably take on 20% of the existing uh, maintenance costs that will go on and going forward. Um, and it is also as, Commissioner McPherson highlighted, going to be a little bit ambiguous as to what will happen uh, moving forward. And so we want to see what five years, seven years, eight, 10 years from now looks like. And we know the cost will accelerate as they get further out. So um, we're in agreement that we can come to some kind of uh, maintenance requirement. County Parks would like to see the ability to maintain the entire trail um, and working with the other jurisdictions because it would provide for more uh, efficient and effective maintenance of the trail. Um, and we think that's more sustainable and we wanna to continue to work collaboratively, but we do have concerns about doing um, any kind of future agreements that would limit us um, currently as it stands. So looking at the first five years, sort of ironing out the details and getting past that, I think is what we were hoping for. And I'll just kind of wrap up quickly then. I uh, see my time's kind of running short. Uh, and I, I also wanna just say that looking towards the future, I know that we may have to figure out other funding sources and what, what that looks like, whether it's a tax measure or some kind of other alternative measure, I know that that's something we need to do because uh, the trail will exist beyond 2046, 20, uh, 2046 and we will have to do other maintenance. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gaffney. Absolutely, uh, a work in in progress. Uh, Somebody else wants to speak. I, think. I see, yeah, there are um, either. Oh, that's right. Thank you. There are other attendees whose hands are up. Um, I will um, now call on uh, Lonnie Faulkner from Equity Transit and just say this is uh, that was the last hand I see. So if anybody does want to make a comment, please get your hand up. Um, otherwise, Ms. Faulkner, you'll be our last speaker. Great. Welcome. Thank you so much um, to the RTC and to Grace Blakesley for that presentation. Absolutely, um, Equity Transit supports an equitable uh, process, and we really appreciate the step-by-step -step work that the RTC has uh, done over the years to bring this trail to life for our county. And um, of course, this provides equitable, safe access for a, an active transit mode, uh, right now through segments 12, we're really looking forward to by the time when we can actually uh, bring Watsonville into that as well so that people from Watsonville can ride their bikes um, and do all the things all the way up to the North County alongside the trail, which is an important um, benefit to the people of Watsonville. I just want to say also, perhaps I know uh, you are all very uh, thoughtful about alternative ideas and plans to bring funding and wonder if there's been any thoughts of working side by side with the Santa Cruz Mountain Trail Stewardship. We have a lot of trail stewardship in this county and perhaps donations and work by uh, people within the county who have wanted to see this trail for so long might be a way to include the community in participating and having skin in the game in this wonderful trail project. I know we've heard over and over from the group trail now that has wanted this trail for a long time and, and they can put their money and their time where their mouth is and help contribute as well alongside many of us. Um, I just want to also mention the 30% increase in uh, accidents and aggressive driving and issues on the roads is absolutely huge. We need to consider access from the roads to the trail. Um, and I would I would really ask the RTC to consider looking at other countries that are more advanced in their um, process of safe streets. There are some amazing solutions out there and um, really, really great projects that I'd like to see included. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. 
I will bring it back to the commission and call on Commissioner Schifrin. Thank you, um, Commissioner Allen. You can never tell. Um, yeah. I want to thank uh, the staff for the report. I'm supportive of the staff recommendations, but I think it's important to remember that Measure D is a closed fund. All we have is the money that's going to come in from sales tax. That's the only way that the mission can use its funds to fund, help fund the highways, help fund rail, help fund rail. When that money's gone, that's the end of it. Let's say they're not a tax measure. I'm very concerned with um, sections between Segment 12 and Section 18. So, 19 and 20, David, as well. I'm not that knowledgeable about the South County Trails. But what I'm very concerned about is if the Commission is having to spend so much of its money or large segments of its money on maintenance, it's not going to be able to complete the trail. And so, we're going to end up with a trail that goes part of the way there. Um, and it's the South County area that's going to be have the least support. Another thing, what's confusing to me or what's bothersome to me is that all of the jurisdictions have made commitments to bike facilities. They have policies to increase biking. They have policies to increase um, make the city more walkable. From my perspective, the rail trail is a component in the local jurisdiction bike and pedestrian networks. It's a, it should be a part of those networks. To sort of look at it as something that doesn't have any, you know, will maybe try to help out is really, um, I think, a denial of what's a legitimate responsibility to maintain facilities that are serving their population, as well as the population of the, of the county as a whole as well as the visitors to the county. So there's nothing that the commission can do to compel the local jurisdictions, separate entities, to take on the responsibility for maintenance. But I think it's really important that the commission ask them to, because I'm just very afraid that if we don't, we're not going to be able to complete the trail. And that would be a terrible thing. One approach that I would suggest as a way of maybe operationalizing the concern is to have agreements that the commission would increase it, would take on responsibility for maintenance after the trail is completed if funds are to remain available. Because I think that, that would make sense. It's supposed to be for the, the rail trail itself. But I think the first priority needs to be the construction trail. And not being able to do that, I think, um, should be. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Koenig, I'm sorry I skipped you. <laughs> Fine. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first off, uh, certainly uh, second Commissioner Schifrin in saying that um, I think we should find every opportunity we can to complete the trail all the way to Watsonville. That's the um, the true benefit of it will be as a facility that connects uh, and unites our county. Um, I'm also very supportive of the staff recommendations. Um, I think it's excellent that we are considering maintenance in uh, in our long term planning. Um, I did have a question. So um, you'd asked or you'd mentioned pavement maintenance and trash as components of the cost estimates. I mean, does it also consider uh, potential storm or water damage and vegetation management? Um, what are all the components that went into that budget? Yeah, good question. Um, thanks for asking it. Um, yes, vegetation management is included. Um, when you also asked about storm damage, it does include after year five uh, contingency for unexpected events. So that's how that's um, included in the cost. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, I'd certainly uh, also echo uh, something the member of the public said, which is maintenance matters. Um, I think uh, a good percentage, I mean, maybe north of 75% of my job is dealing with uh, com complaints and concerns that the public have around maintenance of various public facilities. Uh, our roads are possibly the most obvious example where, uh, you know, we're continu continually struggle to maintain um, a 
a road network that is in shape. Um, but we're just underfunded as a county. I mean, to as Commissioner Schifrin also well knows, I mean, our the, the state property tax, or I should say the property tax and sales tax formulas uh, are not kind to the county of Santa Cruz. We really get the short end of the stick. And uh, that makes it difficult and sometimes even impossible to maintain our facilities to the to the extent that they should be. Um, and I'll, I'll give one small example. I mean, an issue that blew up um, if in my district over the summer was just the tall weeds along Capitola Road. Uh, and we had used um, some of the funds that that's, that's a redevelopment project, all those street trees and beautification there. Um, and we had some money allocated for maintenance, but uh, as inflation rapidly exceeded uh, the cost, or, or I should say the budget that we had available, um, you know, we were making tough decisions uh, around whether or not we should be grinding down sidewalks to prevent tripping hazards or cutting weeds. Um, you know, we're ultimately gonna have to go back and find a, a way to increase the overall budget there. But uh, yeah, maintenance really does matter, right? And it's, um, like I said, it's the number one thing that I hear about every day. So. Uh, Fully support the staff recommendation, which includes budget for ongoing maintenance. Um, in fact, I've moved the staff recommendation. Second. Okay. Um, uh, I um, believe that we um, we have a motion and a second on the floor. I see other commissioners want to comment. Uh, Commissioner Bertrand, you're up. Yeah, I I certainly agree. We need to have maintenance agreements before we jump into any project. Um, we're not even yet at the a juncture of understanding what the projects are going to be. We don't clearly know what the costs of mo many of the segments here. We're still in EIR phase at this point. And jumping into maintenance policies, the intent is good, but tying our hands at this point seems a little ahead of the game from my perspective. I think it's absolutely true that we will not be able to build segments if we're being encumbered by maintenance demands. Um, it's gonna eat away at our budget as we go forward, forward and past 47 is not addressed also. So the elephant in the room for me when I first got started was the fact that we still don't have clear concepts of how much the trail or the rail and filling all our obligations to the public when they voted for D in terms of what it's gonna cost this community. Measure D was just basically a planning vehicle so that we could be able to see what those costs are. And we still don't have those costs We're moving in that direction. One comment from the public was the idea that we're moving piecemeal. And, you know, we do have something to the state right now, which will give us an overall cost of what the whole system will cost or a large portion of the system. And to me, once we have that concept, excuse me, once we have those figures, then we can plan accordingly to the maintenance issues. I was on a school board once, San Lorenzo Valley, and maintenance was always an issue because funding wasn't provided. That's why we have all sorts of measures. There's K is coming up right now because we, well, I don't know enough about K, but often maintenance is put off and then it goes back to the public, which may or may not support it. So I could envision a project complete and no one wants to use it. I mean, this is possible just with the junk and no one's going to go walk past Aptos because they're out in the middle of who knows where with who knows what's on the trail and it's not really fun to see it. It is true that many people have talked about how wonderful it would be to ride my bike from here to there and this is what I envision and it's very idealistic if we're not able to maintain it. So I do support the idea that we should have maintenance agreements, totally. But I don't think we're ready to start moving forward on this, if I understand this whole thing correctly, when I read everything, until we clearly understand what we're getting into. I wanna see the EIR, I wanna see the cost estimates, 
I want to get a better idea if this county could actually afford. And it's true, we may be doing piecemeal. We'll be only able to do certain segments in the north part of the county, not because I don't want to go down to Watsonville, but because the further south we go, the further the costs go up and the difficulties in the train and the difficulties in the trestle, not just Capitola, but there's many trestles past that. And this has been the issue all along. And, you know, if you have some comments on that, I would really appreciate it. But, and I appreciate the staff report and I, re, I appreciate uh, your effort in putting this together. And I totally support staff and whatever they do. But I'm trying to put out a perspective that I think needs to be mentioned. And I would do want to report, uh, excuse me, support the idea of looking ahead for maintenance. You know, I think we should move ahead on trying to work with parks, with the city of Santa Cruz, with any other age, um, area that we're going through. And, you know, what Andy said is right. This is part of a total system in Santa Cruz. And, you know, when you mentioned that, you know, it struck a nerve. I mean, a, a, you know, that was a good thing to hear, actually. And it should be a coherent plan. And so that's why I'm going to vote no, because I don't think we're ready to do this at this point. We need to have that coherent plan. And I thank Andy for bringing that point up. We're not there yet. We're far, far, far away from it. We have a lot of people that support the idea in concept of a trail and a rail, but we're not there to deliver it yet because we don't yet have identi identified sources for the money. We think we do, but we don't even know what amount that money is going to be. We're trying to get there. Thank you very much. May I reply? Yes, please. Um, thank you for your comments, Commissioner Birch. I just wanted to provide two points of clarification uh, regarding the staff recommendation. Um, for now, we are recommending that we you direct us to negotiate maintenance agreements with local jurisdictions before construction. And really, um, from a practical perspective, the next uh, step we would take is to begin negotiations uh, for maintenance of segment five, which is the project that we expect to be constructed next uh, pending the funding award in November. So although it says negotiate maintenance funding uh, agreements with local jurisdictions, it's not um, meant to suggest that we would start to negotiate maintenance agreements for the entire trail at this time. So it would become a uh, step by step. Um, the other piece I wanted to clarify is the staff recommendation is to budget funds for maintenance annually as part or to have the RTC consider budgeting funds, um, programming funds, maintenance annually as part of your measure D five year plan. So any um, agreement that we entered into would not necessarily commit funding uh, indefinitely for the trail maintenance of those segments, but would still come back to the, it would be subject commission approval with the five year plan update. Um, and I think that, um, you know, considers your comments about trying to deliver the trail as well as the maintenance commitments that need to happen and allows the commission to make a decision as they move forward and have more information. And I don't know if so there's anything else you want to add. The, and I appreciate your comments. Thank you very much and your reply. And so that first my understanding a little bit better, but basically what you're saying is we're, we're going to make agreements as we go. Yes. Yes, as before the trail segments are constructed, yes. Right. And, you know, as, as Bruce mentioned, you know, we don't know as we go how much the usage is going to cost us as if it gets more popular and stuff like that. Um, certainly, if we can't afford to build the D segments, if I want to call them that, much beyond, let's say, Aptos or Capitola or something like that, our costs are going to be very low. And so that will be easier to to budget, I suppose that's what you would think. So if I could add a point of clarification too, um, Measure D, um, the expenditure plan was very ambitious, but it was also very honest with the voters. Um, it didn't promise that the entire trail would be able to be delivered with the funds that um, were voted on, but that we would be able to use the funds to leverage additional fund sources that would be needed to complete the trail system. How we do that is, is going to be tricky. The, the trail is an extremely expensive project. Um, the rail line is also an extremely expensive project. 
Um, we are working very hardly hard to try to deliver as much of the trail as we possibly can. And we're prioritizing the sections where our populations are the highest and the use is expected to be the highest. Um, our cost estimates have been coming in exceedingly higher than originally anticipated. Um, but the project benefits that we could deliver are immense. And um, we don't know exactly what the cost is going to be, and we won't know um, before we um, have the opportunity to build some of these sections. So we are kind of taking a um, take it as we go approach um, to to developing the trail to show the public that we can complete a good portion of what what they were promised. Um, and when we do complete that and they see the benefits of it, there may be other opportunities to look at, you know, what it's going to take to complete the trail segments. Um, we um, want to get these maintenance agreements in place before we start construction, but we want the maintenance agreements not to expire and we want the local jurisdictions to take ultimate responsibility of maintaining the trail. And that's part of staff's recommendation. It's not to allow these maintenance agreements to expire, um, but it only promises to maintain them or fund a portion of the maintenance for the five-year period that we program the funding for. So I think that kind of ties with Andy's, uh, Commissioner Schifrin's um, approach that maybe RTC can maintain the trail after it's completed if funding is available, but we don't want to leave the trail segments without a source of maintenance. And I know that that's an area of contention with the county, you know, so, so some input from the commissioners as to what would be acceptable would be helpful because the county has indicated that they, they would like these maintenance agreements to expire when the funding expires. And that would leave the trail with no no funding source for maintenance. So it's a it's a tricky kind of situation of, you know, do you do nothing now or do you do as much as you can and then leverage the successes that we are given through the opportunities presented to us to gain voter trust to continue to to build the system that the community seems to want. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McPherson? Yeah, uh, as one of the um, members that put the Measure D together to try to, and the reason it passed is it had, it included all modes of transportation and all, each and every one of those modes of transportation, whether it be a trail or a highway or a train, it it's going to cost more than we could have anticipated uh, and understandably so. But I, um, I think that uh, this is really a good point that Andy and uh, Jock uh, brought up that um, we want to have the trail there before uh, that really serves a big part of the population before we um, start to maintain it and use all the money there. But this directs staff to negotiate those agreements. And I want to say thank you to the county and the cities and the staff for uh, getting to this point because um, that's been that's a big step in itself. And I'd like to see what those maintenance agreements really include. Um, I'm going to support this now, um, but I think the point that Andy made, um, you know, needs to be uh, better understood by me for sure. Um, so um, I'm going to support the motion, but I think there's uh, good points have been made about uh, let's build the trail first before we start maintaining some parts of it. And uh, I think that uh, that was a good points that were brought up and also I'll support the motion, but I think there's more work to do and I appreciate the work that has been done up to now. Thank you. Okay, I think we are ready uh, to take a vote on this. I just wanna make one quick, uh, or a couple of quick comments. I, I really agree with the, um, perspective that Commissioner Schifrin shared and others have picked up on here about the um, uh, that making our first priority completion of the, the trail. And um, 
but I also want to say that, you know, I mean, maintenance is maintenance is not is is critical. Um, it's always underfunded across all agencies for all functions, it seems. And so this is a really challenging, uh, you know, project and a, and a challenging kind of general um, area for uh, for for resource revenue generation. So um, I think under the circumstances that you all, um, our staff is doing an amazing job of trying to balance that and trying to to navigate how. Um, and and I believe your goal is to get as much cost sharing as possible and to create opportunities for additional funding um, in the future. And so I absolutely support those efforts. And um, with the uh, intention of rail uh, trail build out being the first priority, um, we know that there are you know maintenance needs that that just are are urgent and immediate that need to happen. And um, so I recognize you're you're doing. Uh, the very best you can under the constrained uh, circumstances. So with that, I will call for a vote. Thanks. Commissioner Bertrand. So I, I'm gonna change my position. Um, you've answered the questions that I've had and um, my main effort, my main reason why I'm changing is because we're gonna have these reviews as we go okay yeah. and we will construct as we are able to maintain right yes I just want to hear that okay i'll say i support commissioner sandy brown aye commissioner johnson aye commissioner montesino yes commissioner caput Commissioner Hernandez, are you filling in? Yes. Okay. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin. Aye. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner McPherson. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Aye. Commissioner Parker. Yes. And Commissioner Alternate Kalantari Johnson. Aye. <clears throat> that passes unanimously. Thank you. That brings us to our final item, which is announcement of our next meetings. The next hybrid RTC meeting is scheduled for Thursday, November 3rd, 2022 at 9 a.m. See you here or uh, in cyberspace. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Meeting adjourned.